Well, this feels like a Thanksgiving segment. Not long after his last visit with us, April 2010, Dr. Larry Crabb entered a second battle with cancer. Uh, it is just a joy to have the well-known psychologist, conference speaker, Bible teacher, preacher, beloved author, and uh, the founder and director of New Way Ministries. Of course, he has a new book, and how fitting is this title? Fully Alive, a biblical vision of gender that frees men and women to live beyond stereotypes. Nothing wasted in your life, Dr. Crabb. <laughs> I sure trust not. God is able to use anything. How are you? I'm actually feeling rather decent for a cranky old man. <laughs> You've just had more surgery four weeks ago? Five weeks ago, yeah. Five weeks ago? It went well. Unstoppable. I think you make the enemy angry. I hope so. He just doesn't stop. Yeah. And neither do you. Well, this is just fun. Um, I, have I read this before I forgot? You said, if I ever publish my autobiography, I'll call it Sovereign Stumbling. <laughs> What's that about? You know, I look back on my life and where I've ended up, I had no plans to be here. I had no plans to be a psychologist. I had no plans to be a Bible teacher. I didn't know what I planned. So I've been stumbling along, making all sorts of decisions that I didn't know where they were heading. But looking back, God was sovereign all the way, and he put me in the position he wanted me to be in. So I stumbled, he was sovereign, life is working. Keep it simple, that's so good. Now, I, I'm pretty sure that a favorite quote is the catalyst for your latest yes, book. Yes, absolutely. You want to quote that early church father? An old theologian named Irenaeus wrote a quote that has been in my mind for about 20 years and came alive when I began to write this book. And the quote is, the glory of God is a human being made fully alive. When I read that 20 years ago, it made no impact on me. But about three or four years ago, maybe a little bit more, I thought, what does it mean to live fully alive? And then I translated that or shifted that into, what's it mean for me to be fully alive as a man? What does it mean for you to be fully alive as a woman? Because you made us male and female. So that quote got me thinking about what's it mean to be fully alive in my masculinity, for my wife to be fully alive in her femininity. And I concluded that the answer from the scripture is really different than our culture teaches. Well, we shouldn't be surprised at your vulnerability <clears throat> in this book. I'm gonna quote you. Oh dear. <laughs> My path to counterfeit masculinity started on the ball field, shifted to the bedroom, and moved into the boardroom. <laughs> you want to flesh that one out for oh, us? Oh dear, I guess I could. Um, you know, I found myself as a younger guy pretty competent in athletics. I played ball pretty well. And I can recall when I hit the winning home run, and I felt like I'm the man. I got life made. I played tennis in college. I played decently. I was never great, but I was good enough to feel good about myself. So that was my athletic talent. I think your sweetheart was in the stands watching at the time, too. Since we met at age 10 and began dating at 12, she was there watching me. And I felt, you know, how lucky she is to have an athlete for a guy that she's falling in love with. Hmm. Aren't I something to have the, the, the privilege she has of being with me? I'm a man. And then um, I got married, and uh, we enjoyed each other as a couple, and there was a good enjoyment there, and I figured, well, everything's fine. And I became, quote, successful, began writing some books, and uh, began doing seminars, and I thought, I'm the man. And I really realized in the middle of all that that I think I was worshiping a counterfeit definition of masculinity. Can I feel good about myself because I'm successful? Can I feel good about myself because I'm athletic? Can I feel good about myself because I can afford to buy my wife a car? And I think that was my very false definition of masculinity, which is very common in our culture. Success, ability, talent, whatever. And that added up to a big zero in terms of my wife's appreciation of me. It was in the 20 years of marriage, she once said to me, and this is quite a sentence, but it's true. She said, I'm not looking forward to growing old with you. Oh dear. And when I heard that, I was slapped in the face or hit in the stomach, and I thought, she wasn't being mean, she was hurting. And I didn't know why. And I began to think then about what does it mean for me as a man to touch my wife's soul and to live as a masculine man. I'm gonna quote you again. The God I was revealing to my wife was the God of this world, even as I preached in churches and wrote Christian books. Her soul was invisible to me. And that's the greatest fear of a woman, to feel invisible in her relationships. And I was making her feel invisible. I wasn't seeing her as the uniquely feminine woman that she was. And I wasn't taking it upon myself to nourish that, to encourage that, to enjoy that, to 
to, to be there for her in meaningful ways, that really wasn't centrally on my mind. I was too busy being a man by cultural false standards. Now, Dr. Crabb, part of this is, is just being male. I mean, from Mars, whatever. I mean, men <laughs> typically do shut down. They are motivated by tasks. We women anchor our lives in relationships, so we, we really are different. It's just reporting recently that your, your brain goes front to back and ours crisscrosses. That's right, I read that too just but recently. We're, all wi we're wired differently. We really are. Um, do we women expect too much from the person God made a man to be? I think you expect too little. I think there's a vision that a woman needs to have for her husband, for her sons, for her brothers in Christ, for her blood brothers, a real vision that, that, that God has in mind for what a man can be, what he's called to be, what he's equipped to be, what God makes it possible for him to become. When a woman has a real vision for a man, as I think my wife has a real vision for me, we've written vision letters to each other, and her vision for me when I first let, let her read it to me some years ago just kind of stirred me to new heights. So I think you tend to, women tend to ask too little of uh, men because we're, although we're wired for achievement, could the achievement be a little different than financial success or athletic success or any other kind of success? Could it be a vision for what it would mean for me to have the courage to enter the chaos of relationship where I don't know what to do, but God will provide me what I need to do what the other person most deeply wants? When I'm moving into the chaos of relationship, that's when I feel most masculine. That's when I'm most alive as a man. I'm not sure at what point you diagnosed your pursuit of displayed talent, pleasurable lust, and recognized success. <laughs> uh, but what did you do about it? How did you bring change? Because Rachel has written a glowing chapter at the end of this book. I loved reading that. That was a lot of fun to read. Oh, when I began to recognize that, oh, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, I didn't do much with it for a while. But then as I, was, as I was teaching in different settings, I began to realize that if, if we bear the image of God, and we do, Genesis 1, 26 and 27, but we bear the image as male and female, that just recently, 10, 15 years ago, began to profoundly intrigue me. And I thought that's gotta mean something I haven't even thought about. Mm -hmm. What does it mean for me to bear the image of God as a male? What does it mean for Rachel and every woman to bear the image of God as a female? And that got me thinking very deeply and, and drove me to the scriptures because I figured the world's all mixed up on this and I wanna have God's thoughts on the matter. And that meant my option was to read the Bible and study it and mm -hmm. out came the book. And out comes this statement. Relational masculinity is revealed in a man who remembers God's story and moves to advance its plot. Yes, that's exactly what I believe. And I really think that one of the reasons that guys don't advance God's story is we don't realize what the story is. If we could get some picture of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit having a great time in their relationality because they're a relational God, they're not a task-oriented God, they're a relational God. And because of their relationality, they moved into the mess that we've made of life, the incarnation. And do I realize that the story of God is a story of a God that moved into the chaos of the mess we've made? And if I, if I understand that story, can I reveal the nature of God's relationality by moving into the chaos of my relationships? And when I have no idea what to do, when Rachel and I have a little bit of a fight or something, sometimes a big one, when I have no idea what to do and has difficulty with, 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 with my children, with, with other people, when I have no idea what to do, do I back into my sphere of competence or do I move into the sphere of chaos with the strength of God for the purpose of telling the story of God by moving into chaos? Do I have the courage to do that? The degree to which I do that is the degree to which I can enjoy the fact that I'm a God-revealing man. Okay, and that's masculinity. I, I'm just feeling a lot of grace and humility and mercy uh, accompanying you as you go into that chaos. <laughs> Without that, I'd be overwhelmed. Mm. without dependence. You see, I think in order for a guy to be a guy in the fullest sense of the word, we're gonna need to live in such a way that requires the grace and the mercy of God. But because I don't know if I trust him well enough for that, I wanna move more naturally into spheres where he isn't all that necessary. You're holding your ground there. And as a result, mm. I sacrifice my calling to be a man. And the potential. And this is not just marriage. Let's be no, really no. clear. This is relationships. Yes. I, I love the picture you give of the bridge of connection. Mm -hmm. And you've got 
two people at either end. You want them to meet on yes, that bridge. At the level of their souls. Now, what are the greatest barriers? Wh whoever we're picturing on either side, what, what are the barriers that need to come down? Fear, terror. I believe that every man and every woman has a core terror. If I'm called by God to reveal the way he moves into chaos, then my terror is I'm not gonna have the weightiness, the substance, the solidness. I'm not gonna have what I need to meaningfully move into chaos, but I know where I am competent. So I tend to stay there because my fear is not realized. But when safer. I'm called, to, I'm safer. Mm -hmm. When I'm called to move across the bridge of connection and to connect with another person, then I'm afraid I don't have the substance to make it happen. And that's when I have to depend on God. The core terror of a man I call weightlessness. I don't have what it takes. Now I'm sure you've experienced this already. Uh, with this very new book this year, yep. published 2013, well, published 2013. Uh, just to say the word femininity to some women it, is a flashpoint. Like, yeah. you better duck. <laughs> um, I've had to duck a few times. I was teaching on this one particular time and a woman just publicly spoke up and she was irate. And she said, when I hear the word feminine, all I feel from you men is that I'm being used. I've gotta be a girly girl was a phrase that she used and you're denying my, my value, my substance as a person. And if I'm doing that, I'd rather tear up the book because that's not what I'm doing. That's not what I believe is required. But I do believe there's gonna be some pushback and hopefully based on misunderstanding. Mm. I'm gonna risk one more thing because I just loved this point. Uh, I'm sure this is true, male or female, to become who we most want to be, we need to cry the tears we most fear. Yes, yes, I believe that's very true. Until we get down to the depths of our fear, and for a woman, I believe the fear is invisibility. Mm. If, if I'm to be open, if a woman is to be open as a woman, and that's what the word for a female means in Genesis 1, to be opened. And if she is to be opened and inviting, like Jesus, who after the incarnation, after the crucifixion, in his resurrection said, I want you to come join the party. Mm. I want you to come join the dance that I've made available to you. He's very invitational. And when someone doesn't come, when you've invited them, it's really tough. And the woman's gonna feel invisible, and that's her terror. And until I'm willing to face the tears of my terror, and a woman's willing to face the fear of her terror, we're not gonna learn the strength of God to move into our masculinity and femininity. Mm. Aren't these wonderful, typical Larry Crabb challenging thoughts? And uh, we, we just can't let them go with uh, one slice of this. Tomorrow, uh, we will again reach into the pages of Fully Alive, a biblical vision of gender that frees men and women to live beyond stereotypes. It's at our e-store. Be sure to join us tomorrow for more thoughts. Mm. Thank you, Dr. Crabb. Thank you.